Peter Parker and Spider-Man have been a part of our culture now for many, many, many years, and many generations of people have their own love of the character in the comics. You know, it's a really daunting thing to be part of something that you know has a built-in fan base and people that are very protective of the material, but then it becomes exciting. People say, oh, why would you do it again? But the comic book reinvented itself many, many times. You know, there are many iterations of Peter Parker over the 50 years, always with the same root characteristics. And we really got very interested in the other stories about Spider-Man that never been delved into. I had trepidation about the idea of me stepping into the responsibility of it, and I didn't want to ruin the fantasy of it, and I didn't want to take him down from the pedestal that I'd put him on, you know, I'm talking about the fictional character of Spider-Man. Mark really wanted to go sort of old school and see real people doing stuff. I do feel an obligation to the audience to make something worthy of the Spider-Man mantle. And that's, that's hard, but such is life. Spider-Man 3, we talked to Sony about doing a Spider-Man 4 with Toby, and um, we went pretty far down the road. There were a couple different versions of the story, um, and I think, you know, that ultimately there was a feeling that it was time to reinvent, you know, to start fresh. We didn't have a natural extension because in essence, you had an origin in movie one. In movie two, you had Spidey No More. And in movie three, you had the dark versus light. And I think we covered the Mary Jane relationship to the extent that we literally needed to find someone else for Mary Jane. Moving into progress created some challenges that, that I think Sam and Toby and us were starting to question the validity of the next one. It was a huge challenge. You know, I, I think we, and I was president of the studio at the time, so I was wearing a slightly different hat although the challenge was no less daunting. We all knew that we wanted to keep telling Spider-Man stories, but the question was how to do it, and we felt that there was already a history that preceded us of sort of reimagining the character. There are the essential elements to it, and you know, the sort of the all critical message of, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, and what happens between Peter and his Uncle Ben, and all of that, and the spider bite. But there's, there are so many different ways to interpret those events. There's a whole generation who wasn't born in 2002 when Spider-Man 1 came out, so you know, there's a whole audience for whom this is a new experience. So that was kind of the rationale. I was originally hired to write Spider-Man 4 and uh, was really sort of excited to come in and do that because I was, I wanted to, no one had sort of finished out a, a superhero franchise before, sort of on purpose. Um, so that was like a really attractive thing. So Laura Ziskin and Avi Arad sort of brought me in to do that. And then through various kind of, you know, machinations, the movie didn't end up getting made. So Amy Pascal called me and she said, listen, we're not going to end up making Spider-Man 4, but uh, would you be interested in helping us to uh, start again with the franchise. Say chess. Chess. Because of where the stories went in the first three movies, Peter Parker grew up fast. And I think we always felt that if we could go back, which we have this unique opportunity, you know, to start again, that we really wanted to spend more time with Peter Parker in high school. That that was a very appealing part of the comic book. So that was a kind of defining concept for us. And then also 
to change tone a bit. The thing that clicked for me was the idea of doing it in a completely contemporary way, which sounds sort of obvious, but when you give Peter Parker, you know, a cell phone, when you put him in what high school sort of really like today was, was sort of a really interesting idea. And also this idea of making it a movie about what it's like to be an orphan. Where are you going? Something new. Something your mom and I have to do. So much of, of what defines that character is his origin. You know, Peter Parker's, or Spider-Man's origin story is so powerful. And so we wanted to go back, but do it in a way that was also clean and respectful of the old. So with that said, we you did what we do at studios and we thought about who our favorite filmmakers were. We have to be able to see him transform from a human into this <coughs> thing and back again without... Uh, is Patrick here? No, Patrick. Can I ask a con? <laughs> <laughs> so, Patrick, if anybody sees Patrick, it's all a prank call. You sound like his mom. <laughs> Mark Webb, he'd never done anything like this. That's, you know, a, all, a benefit and also like, oh my God, for him and for us, you know. But we loved 500 Days of Summer. We felt that he had a unique style. And so I think it was finding a director who could speak about the character in a fresh way, but in a way that was still true to the ethos, to the gestalt of the comic books. I never thought I would do a comic book movie. It just wasn't part of my DNA. But I think when I was older, it actually became more appealing to me because I think that you start to understand there's some really universal, deep themes that are at work in a lot of these things. And I think I started to appreciate the sophistication of the Spider-Man story in particular. The movie he did before was about a love story and, and came from an emotional place and was not a big special effects movie, I think. It was kind of a testament to how the studio wanted to make this and sort of the direction they wanted this, this movie to go. When his name came up, it, was, it happened to be just after I watched 500 Days of Summer. And, and it was so unusual. And the relationship was so fresh. It wasn't like the normal love story. Actually, it was anything but a normal love story. I knew I wanted to make a movie sooner rather than later because I just didn't want to sit around and contemplate. I wanted to make something. And I had read a few scripts. And I met with the people at Sony, and they actually brought it up to me. And I thought it was the most absurd idea I did 500 Days of Summer, it's about, you know, a guy who's falling in love. It's, it has, what, what possibly could you conceive of that would make this a good idea? But they were fairly persistent. The notion of going from 500 Days to Summer to this global endeavor, frankly, that is, you know, building a Spider-Man franchise, um, was, was pretty overwhelming. They're like, well, what do you want to do? What, what would make this viable to you? And I said, well, if we start over, if we invite new information about the story that people haven't seen before, and we give this kid an edge that I think that any kid who loses his parents at that young of an age, there's an enormous emotional consequence that will color his life from that point forth. Peter, come back here, please. And they were like, okay, sounds good. And I wrote some other, like a, a sort of specific note to them uh, saying, this is the vibe that I'm going for. He had a genuine love for this character and very quickly got over, you know, I think being daunted by it and saw that there was this incredible support and that with Avi and Laura, you know, who had been there and a studio that was completely backing him, it was, you know, it was a, it was a great challenge and he loves a challenge. All right, so when we go this time, everybody on action, everybody has to have something in their head that they're ready to say and then we just go, all right? Mark came in and read it and sort of immersed himself in it and really quickly, I think, responded to who Peter Parker could be and, you know, what a misfit and what an outcast he could kind of be. I view Peter Parker as, not as necessarily as a nerd, per se, because I think nerd in our, the current world is, means a different thing. But the perennial type is the outsider. He's the guy who isn't accepted by the crowd, maybe doesn't want to be entirely, does his own thing. And 
that I think is is what made it appealing to me. In the beginning of our movie, Peter discovers his father's case, and upon opening it, you see a picture, he discovers Ascorp. All of a sudden, his world turned because he found the key to find out more about his, his parents. And now it's Peter's movie. The search for his father is what leads him to get bit by the spider. Ah, ah, ah. Basically, I didn't want the spider bite to be an arbitrary thing. I wanted it to be a representation of his desire to fill a void. And I think that's one of the themes of the movie that, that really had always interested me, is that we all have a missing piece somewhere. We all have something that's gone, a hole, and how we choose to fill that void is how we define ourselves. And I think that was my access point for the character um, when we were developing the project. I'm Richard Parker's son. Peter. The inverse of that, of course, is Dr. Connors, who also has a missing piece manifested in a much more literal way. Yes, in case you're wondering, I'm a Southpaw. <laughs> and he's trying to fill that, but it gets the best of him. My favorite villain of all time is Connors. Because again, it's about loss. Peter suffered the loss, and Connors suffered the loss. Visually, the notion of this kind of Jekyll and Hyde character who was a scientist and a, you know, an enormous crazed lizard was just compelling. I wanted to do a, a villain that was, first of all, you know, something that, that sort of fans knew, but also to tell a very, very simple story. And the story of the lizard is kind of like the most sort of basic emotional story there is. It's a guy who is missing something. And the story we're telling with Peter right now is about a guy who's missing something. So that always seemed to be a really close fit. Great drama comes from competing ideas of what's good and what's right. And I think the lizard believes what he's doing is correct. He thinks he's being compassionate. He thinks that the world around him will be better if they're like him, stronger, less susceptible to disease and weakness. And he doesn't understand that people should have a choice. <laughs> Uh, this is my gift to you. As a filmmaker, he, he's very much about character all the way through. His feeling on it is if you know we get the heart of the story right, you know, the rest of it will fall into place. And next stop, Coney Island. Alright, good and cut. Alright. Cut. That was really good. <laughs>